thank you for waiting. First of all, I, I wanted to uh, congratulate ESPO on uh, its 50th anniversary. Uh, that's an impressive achievement. And thank, thank everyone here very much uh, for being asked to engage in this conversation. Uh, it's very exciting, uh, especially to and thank, and thank Enrique, who not only invited me, but put up with my endless questions. Um, and uh, I uh, look very forward to having a continued conversation with you, uh, as Fabrizio said, uh, for the next 50 years, hopefully. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, another major mission of universities. We've had, we've had a lot of discussion about the challenges and the opportunities that are presented to uh, universities in terms of research that needs to be done. I'm going to talk a, little, a, a, a lot, actually, about one of our other major missions, which is the transfer of knowledge, that is uh, teaching and learning. Uh, and, and thanks to my new friend from Arizona State University, I'll couch this as a grand challenge uh, to double the number of college graduates in the world by, by 2025. Is, it, is that something that's really necessary? Absolutely. The, the problems and challenges that you've heard described here cannot be solved if we do not radically change what we are doing in higher education. One of, one of the problems is the tremendous demand for access. Even if we met that grand challenge of doubling the number of college graduates by 2025, we will have failed to meet the demand. Imagine if we tried to build campuses to meet that demand it would be nearly impossible. Then there's another challenge. Uh, when I was doing research for this talk, you, know, you can find an endless number of reports on the internet that express deep worry about the quality, not only of our uh, elementary and secondary education, but about the quality of our higher education. Much of this started in, in the United States a couple of decades ago with a report called A Nation at Risk. It said our higher education was simply not getting better fast enough to produce the, the, the workforce that we need for the future. So we have major challenges. I'm going to talk about a couple of, I'll, I'll be a little radical here, I'm going to talk about a couple of fundamental organizational changes that I believe have to be made in the structure of higher education in order to meet, these challenge, in order to meet that grand challenge. Uh, and a couple of sort of fun structural problems. One of these problems is that we ask individual faculty to play three very diverse and very different roles. We ask them to be the content expert, the chemist, the physicist, the biologist, the person who studies aquaculture, right? The sociologist. They're first, first and foremost that. We graduate them to do that. But then when they're asked to transfer that knowledge, they're also asked to be experts in instructional design. And if we're really going to assess the quality of what we're doing, if an individual faculty member wants to assess the quality of what they're doing, whether they're being successful in transferring that knowledge or not, we ask them to be an assessment expert. That's a, that's a lot to put on one, one individual, and I'll have a lot to say about that and how ICT can help. The number two problem I'm going to focus on is, well, I'm, I'm not practicing what I preach. Because here I am, standing in front of an auditorium, lecturing at you. And the lecture model is, is actually pretty good in this, this setting, right? Where we're, we're all on the same page and we're giving you sort of a general view of, of our ideas. But, and it scales very well. We could make this an enormous auditorium. I've, I've gone to introductory uh, chemistry classes at Penn State University that have 800 people in them. So it scales pretty well. But it is not effective for novice learners. Right? Many of you are not novice learners, but for, for freshmen, for novice learners, this is not an effective way to transfer knowledge. And we can take technology and we can make it worse. Right? We, can, we can make this auditorium global, right? We can, we can put ourselves on video conferences, we did today, right? But going to hundreds of locations where we get virtually no information from faces about whether you're understanding what I'm saying or not, in Spanish or English, right? And, and, and therefore it becomes a very one-way thing. 
So I'm going to use an analogy all the way through. I'm talking about the first problem first. Imagine this. You want to create a world-class Formula One racing team. And you say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and find the best driver in the world. Emerson Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi, my favorite driver. Right? I'm going to go out and hire the best race driver in the world. No matter what it takes. I'm going to beat everybody else out for him or her. And then I'm going to take this race driver and I say, by the way, I also need you to design the car. And, and oh, there's, there's, a, there's, one, there's one problem. You're also not going to have a pit crew. So you're going to have to do it all. Well, if you were to design such a race team, then you're not going to very frequently be the first one to see this flag. And my fundamental question is, why aren't you going to be? Well, the answer is, Formula One racing is a team sport. The driver may get a lot of the attention, but it is the car designers, the car engineers, the pit crew, it is all that team working together that makes for seeing this flag. Guess what? So is creating and delivering effective instruction. We have heard from many of the pre presenters how research is increasingly becoming a team sport. It's not the individual researcher working in his or her lab, right, producing something on his or her own that produces great science these days. It's grid computing, right? It's people all over the world working on a problem. The Large Hadron Collider, people working all over the world on a problem. Well, this is just as true of teaching. So here's what we ask of our, our faculty, like my hypothetical driver. We ask them to be content experts. And by and large, they are very good content experts. Why? Because our system of education selects for great content experts. If you're not a great physicist, you get weeded out early on, although there's a problem there I'll talk about. And then we ask them, when you're doing your job of transferring knowledge, not creating knowledge, we also want you to be a great instructional designer. We also want you to design the car. And yet, virtually none of us, and I include myself, when I started teaching, and I teach philosophy of science, right? I had, I first taught physics, actually. I had absolutely no training in cognitive science. I had no training in how people learn. I was up there doing what? Emulating how I was taught. And then, did I assess my class? Did I assess how, uh, how effective I was? Well, I gave them a midterm exam, and I gave them a final 